the Honorable Stephen Cadiz, Minister of Transport, who was just caught in a roadblock and will be here shortly. Mr. Curtis Manchun, Chairman of the Board of Governors of the University of Trinidad and Tobago. Pilot Master, Kurt Duncan, Chairman of the Maritime Advisory Council. Ms. Michelle Scipio Hussang, Deputy Chair of the MIDC and Head of Marine Assets, NEC. Mr. Julian Bada, Logistics Manager of BP. Mr. Robert Miller, Coastal Marine Limited. Professor Diana Reinsing, the President of the University of Trinidad and Tobago. Captain Curtin Huggins, Deputy Director, Maritime Services, Maritime Services Department, MSD, Ministry of Transport. Mrs. Vivian Rambarath Parasram, Program Leader, the University of Trinidad and Tobago's Maritime Programs. Professors of the University of Trinidad and Tobago, the distinguished Professor Winston Sweet, students, scholars of the University of Trinidad and Tobago, captains, commanders, and members of the media, good evening. Today is World Maritime Day and we join in this celebration with the Ministry of Transport, Maritime Services Division, and the Trinidad and Tobago Pilots Association. I would like to invite the Chairman of the Board of Governors of the University of Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. Curtis Manchun, to open today's proceedings by giving you a brief message. Mr. Manchun. Thank you very much, Dr. Ali, our Provost, UTT's Provost, the Honorable Stephen Cadiz, Minister of Transport, in his absence. And, and I, I don't think he was caught in the roadblock. I think he was delayed a little while. Uh, Pilot Master Kurt Duncan, Chairman of the Maritime Advisory Council. Ms. Michelle Scipio Hosang, Deputy Chair of the MIDC and Head of the Marine Assets of the National Energy. Mr. Julian Bader, Logistics Manager, BP. Mr. Robert Miller, Coastal Marine Limited. Professor Diana Reinsing, President, UTT. Captain Curtin Huggins, Director, Maritime Services, Maritime Services Department of the Ministry of Transport. Mr. Colin Young, IMO Regional Advisor. Of course, Dr. Ali, Provost, UTT. Mrs. Vivian Rambarat Parasram, the program lead at UTT's Maritime Programs right here at this campus. Students and faculty of UTT. Uh, Academic staff, Professor Sweet and other professors, I see Professor Rauch here as well, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, and a special greeting to two of the first graduates of UTT. Their name escapes me, but I was introduced to them a while ago. They're sitting distinguished in their white shirts right here. Can we give them a round of applause? <laughs> special welcome to you. Good afternoon, and on behalf of the Board of Governors of UTT, let me welcome all of you to today's recognition of World Maritime Day, 
fittingly being held at our Chagaramas campus, which is home to our maritime and marine sciences programs. As an entrepreneurial university, UTT is a strong advocate of the triple helix concept, which links academia to the needs of industry and government in practical and relevant ways. This relationship with government and industry creates a knowledge-based society capable of confidently confronting and solving its problems through professional education, research, and development. As we observe World Maritime Day, this is yet another opportunity whereby UTT can assert its role as the national university and acknowledge the relationships that have been forged through our programs and the academics who administer these programs to our students. As Paul Meyer, noted motivational speaker and founder of the Success Motivation Institute said, productivity is never an accident. It is always the result of a commitment to excellence, intelligent planning, and focused effort. Today we focus on the productivity that is necessary to build Trinidad and Tobago's maritime industry and the crucial relationships that must be navigated with stakeholders of the industry, many of whom are here today. And we thank you for your presence. This is part of our mandate. And as chair of the board, we've been encouraging the staff of the university at all our campuses, whether it's maritime or with oil and gas in Point Lisas, wherever we are, to interact much more closely with the captains and the leaders of the respective industries to understand where the industry is going, what is happening, so that UTT can be at the forefront rather than at the back end of providing the necessary training and development. As a part of the university's thrust to promote education and training in the maritime sector, three undergraduate programs are offered along with several short courses which are tailor-made to meet the requirements of this dynamic maritime industry. As a result of the theoretical and practical training in the maritime sector, our UTT maritime graduates can readily seek employment in the areas of port operation and management, maritime law, and in the marine environment. The worldwide shortage of engineering and navigation officers also guarantees students permanent employment opportunities in what is still an exciting career for young people in the merchant marine and for those entrepreneurially minded graduates, they can also create their own employment opportunities by harnessing their educational experience into lucrative future career paths. What I'm saying, therefore, is that there is a plethora of opportunities that await our maritime graduates. These are the individuals that will play a major role in the development of the maritime sector. And as chairman, I am especially proud to acknowledge UTT's niche role in educating a new generation of scholars for employment and entrepreneurial opportunities in the maritime sector. This will ultimately aid in the further development of our nation's economy. Again, I want to welcome all of you, students, as well as the industry leaders that are here to this evening's proceedings. Thank you very much for being here. And uh, may I say congratulations to those of you who are involved in the sector. Uh, this is probably my first kind of awareness of this. I was noting on the internet that this is the 36th year that World Maritime Day is being celebrated. I'm sure it's a very special day for you. And uh, I gather that in Trinidad and Tobago, apart from the blowing of the horns and the sirens by, by the ship owners and so on, this is probably the only event that is recognizing World Maritime Day is something that we probably take for granted. So thank you all very much for being here. Thank you very much, Chairman of the Board of Governors of the University of Trinidad and Tobago. We'll now like our president, the President of the University of Trinidad and Tobago, Professor Diane Narain Singh, to now bring some brief remarks on this occasion. Professor Narain Singh.
Thank you very much, Chair of this afternoon's proceeding, our Provost, Dr. Fazal Ali. Our Minister of Transport, the Honorable Stephen Cadiz, who I hope should be here very shortly. Mr. Curtis Manchun, Chair of the Board of Governors of the University of Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. Colin Young, IMO Regional Advisor. Captain Curtin Hoggins, Deputy Director, Maritime Services, Maritime Service Department, Ministry of Transport. Important stakeholders in the maritime industry, very special welcome to you. I see so many of you here this afternoon. Our academic staff, senior administrative staff, <clears throat> and most importantly, our students, the future of our nation, very special welcome. Other specially invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, members of the media, a very pleasant good afternoon. On behalf of the University of Trinidad and Tobago, I want to welcome all of you here to our maritime campus in a joint celebration of World Maritime Day. And what an appropriate venue for such an activity. I think you should reflect on that, right? Here is an institution that is in fact training the future human resource capacity of our country in the maritime industry. So it's the most appropriate venue for this sort of thing. And we are, very, we are at UTT very proud to be associated with this event today. World Maritime Day is celebrated every year by the international community to focus attention on the importance of shipping, maritime safety, and also to emphasize particular aspects of the International Maritime Organization's work. And this year's theme is International Maritime Organization, 60 years in the service of shipping. The University of Trinidad and Tobago is only one of two universities in the Caribbean Basin that offers training programs in maritime studies, the other being the University of Technology in Jamaica. And I think that every credit should be given to the founding fathers of UTT for their vision. And I hope that those of you who have not yet visited the facilities at this institution we are having a conducted tour afterwards, and I think you should go. We have the state-of-the-art equipment, especially in the simulation room. I think we should be all proud of this. In fact, the maritime sector is now considered one of the most, import of, one of the most important growth poles of our country with respect to the repositioning of our economy away from an over-dependence on oil and gas towards a more diversified and sustainable economy. And UTT is proud to be part of the training of appropriate human resource needed for this socioeconomic transformation. And there are a number of growth poles, and I'd like to mention this, in, mention in our medium-term strategic development plan for sustainable development. And those growth poles among them will be, of course, the maritime industry, the creative industries, ICT, energy, and food sustainability. And for the benefit of our visitors, each one of our campus, in fact, has as its focus one of these growth poles. So this is the maritime campus. Unlike many sectors, the importance of the maritime sector to our economy is not obvious to most of our population. And what a pity. Nor is the pursuit of a career in maritime studies appears as a viable option to many of our young people, such as medicine, law, engineering, IT, etc. And I think this is where career guidance is becoming even more critical for us here in Trinidad and Tobago, because the industries of the future are changing at a rapid pace. 
and as such, the skill sets that, which are now demanded of a modern day workforce is also rapidly changing. And I've said at so many occasions, in fact, when I address the students here at Orientation Day, a generation is now three to four years. And therefore, the skill sets, that's a technological generation, and therefore, the skill sets which are demanded of today's modern workforce will be changing at the same rate. And therefore, as educational institutions, we have to be prepared to ensure that we properly equipped our people with the appropriate skill sets to meet this rapidly changing you know, industries. The maritime industry has always and will, and will always become even more strategic to socio-economic development of Trinidad and Tobago. Could we imagine for one moment what will be the status of our petrochemical sector without an efficient, modernized set of marine services? Just think of that. Let us for a moment also take a look at our surrounding right here and ourselves, the way we are dressed this afternoon. And let us ask ourselves the simple question, where did the sealing material came from? Or the seating material? Or the clothes we wear? How did it get here? And I'm sure if you reflect a minute, you'll see the majority came through the maritime industry, right? By imports. The fact is that we have evolved as a civilization and come a long way from remoteness and the move towards a high level of hyper interconnectivity to the other parts of the globe. Shipping has, is what is responsible for bridging the, the ocean gaps and indeed contributing to making the world a global village. This demand fueled the growth of the shipping industry. And like any other industry, during this growth phase, an evaluation needs to be conducted to ensure that there is an equitable balance of the social, economic, and environmental components of the industry. When transport systems are efficient, they provide economic and social opportunities and benefits that result in a positive multiplier effect, such as better accessibility to market, employment, and additional investment. When transport systems are deficient in terms of capacity or reliability, they can have an economic cost, such as reduced or missed opportunities and lower quality of life for our people. Through UTT's maritime programs, Trinidad and Tobago has the potential to rise to the challenge of further developing of our maritime sector by facilitating the development of our maritime human resource capability and I've said before that the role of UTT as a National University of Trinidad and Tobago is threefold. One, of course, is to produce the appropriate human resource required by our various stakeholders. And the second, through our research, development, and innovation, find solutions to problem. And the third, which I think is very critical, is through our research, development, and innovation to keep our society one step ahead of our competitors. If we don't do these three things, then as we say, we'll always be playing catching up game. Here at UTT, all our seafaring programs have been revised to achieve compliance with the new prescriptions of the STCW Manila amendments. And in this respect, and I want students to recognize this, UTD's maritime programs have produced over 120 graduates varying from the diploma to the master's level program. So to date, we have produced 120 of these graduates. And of these graduates, 44 are qualified officers of the watch in navigation and engineering. And two of our navigation graduates have recently completed their chief mate's license in the, in the UK and are soon to join the prestigious ranks of the Trinidad and Tobago Pilots Association. And two of our master's graduates have returned to join the maritime faculty to support the building of our maritime programs. And this is building capacity in our own country. In addition, we have trained over 3,000 persons in maritime short courses over the years. And I want to commend the faculty for achieving this target over the, that short period of time. 
the maritime programs, But we are not stopping there. The maritime programs at UTT will expand in due course to offer courses at the chief engineers and chief mates level in order to meet the demands of our graduates for higher professional education and certification. Remember, education is a journey, right? There's not, you, don't, you get on the train, you come off, and you go back on the train and continue. It's a lifelong learning. Such levels of training have never before been offered in Trinidad and Tobago, and we hope to exceed, the to exceed the regional and international standards for such programs, because quality assurance and accreditation are very crucial in our programs. Plans are also currently at pace to launch a certificate program that will lead to qualifications for ratings and able-bodied seamen. This will also provide a route for these certificate graduates to feed into the diploma programs. And I think I stand on safe ground when I say that UTT will have most, or I would say all aspects of maritime training requirements covered in the coming years. In Trinidad and Tobago, our commitment to providing the education base for these seafarers is evident by the existence of our maritime campus in which we are all seated today in celebration of World Maritime Day. These young and ambitious students that we see at the back are trained here to build the much needed human resource capacity and cap capability to propel the local maritime sector forward and will contribute greatly to the economic diversification and strengthening of our nation. With a keen insight into the concept of sustainable development, they would also be a resource for environmental protection and enable social development pro programs to be de developed as our economy continues to develop as well. Statistics show that developing countries continue to thrive, accounting for 41% of global trade in 2012. This reflects their growing resilience to economic setbacks and increasingly leading role in driving global trade. And Trinidad and Tobago, of course, is considered to be one of these developing economies. The shifting patterns of trade are associated with the rapid industrial growth of developed, developing countries. Trinidad and Tobago moving from an agricultural-based economy to, other, to a manufacturing-based economy and now to an energy-based economy tends to drive, up the, to drive up the import intensity of production. Moreover, global trade increase, increase, re, invo, increasingly involves value chains with different geographical locations contributing various parts to the production process. Developing countries are expanding their participation in a range of different maritime business, and they already hold strong positions in areas like ship scrapping, ship registration, and the supply of seafarers. They have a growing market share in, the, in more capital-intensive and technologi technologically advanced maritime sectors, such as ship construction and ship owing. In fact, statistics show that nine out of the 20 large countries in ship owning are developing countries. And this is where I think the government, the, the policy makers, are quite strategic when they have earmarked the maritime industry as one of the growth poles and to be the gateway, Trinidad and Tobago being the gateway to the Americas. So the future is open to us here in TNT. And we at UTT are committed to playing our role in national development. However, a sustainable shipping industry or I should say maritime industry, requires the coordination from all sectors. And our chairman referred to the triple helix approach to development. We are UTT, as I said, are prepared to play our part. In closing, I would like to encourage our maritime industry to be the change agents we need to bring about the appropriate changes we require to propel our industry forward to a sustainable economic development. I thank you.
Students, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I would like to ask you kindly to stand and welcome Honest Minister Kedis, the Minister of Transport. As you all know, students, we are here at a university for formation. And you know when the captain is on the deck, you stand. And I'd like to ask Professor Vivian to review the safety briefing so that perhaps we would say in the future, persons on the port will use the doors on port side Set a course of 90 degrees south, bearing seawards with the wind on your back. <laughs> Captain? <laughs> aye, aye. It is quite intriguing since 1492 that Christopher Columbus set sail to find a way to China. And in 2013, we are still doing that with the expansion of the Panama Canal. It is an intriguing thing for students to ponder about. And it is in this context, I would like to invite the, C the International Maritime Organization, the Secretary General, Mr. Colin Young, the regional advisor for that organization, to now address you. Thank you, Dr. Ali. Good afternoon, everyone. Just uh, allow me a couple of minutes just to get set up here, please. My heart sort of skipped a beat when we started here this afternoon. For some reason, um, when, um, as Dr. Ali mentioned about the, the safety briefing, the, I was there just going through my notes, etc., and I just heard out of the corner of my ear Colin mentioned very early in, 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 in the set here. And I was a little concerned, but Vivian is not my time as yet, I would say. You all don't, 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 don't like that up in the back? <laughs> Honorable Minister, Chairman of the Board of Governors and President UTT, Deputy Director, Maritime Services Division, Distinguished guests, academic staff and students, ladies and gentlemen, members of the media. It is my privilege to bring you greetings and best wishes on behalf of Mr. Koji Sekimizu, Secretary General of the International Maritime Organization, to the Ministry of Transport, the University of Trinidad and Tobago, the Trinidad and Tobago Pilots Association, for the organization of this event in celebration of World Maritime Day. As you may be aware, maritime transportation is an essential component of any program for sustainable development because the world relies on safe, secure, and efficient international, and efficient international shipping industry. This can only be achieved under the comprehensive regulatory framework developed by IMO, which provides a blueprint for countries to develop their maritime transport infrastructure in a safe, efficient, and environmentally sound manner. As the delivery mechanism for global trade, international maritime transport supports and sustains a huge number of wealth creating and poverty alleviating activities, both in developed and developing countries. Shipping provides job opportunities for over 1.5 million seafarers globally, the vast majority being from developing countries. Should the world economy continue to grow and annual demand 
of more than 50,000 new highly trained and qualified seafarers will be required. This year's World Maritime Day theme, Sustainable Development, IMO's contribution beyond Rio Plus 20, was chosen in order to focus IMO's efforts during 2013 on carrying out the commitments made at the UN Conference on Sustainable Development, better known as Rio Plus 20, held in June 2012 in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Post Rio 20 Plus, the Secretary General began work on the promotion of sustainable maritime development and established an internal mechanism to work with IMO's industry partners. Full stop. The deliberations of the internal mechanism precipitated the concept of a sustainable maritime transportation system. It has envisioned that a sustainable maritime transportation system must cover a broad range of activities, some of which IMO has traditionally only had marginal influence. The intention, however, is not to broaden the scope of IMO's activities, but rather to widen awareness of the importance of the system through increased understanding of the coordination opportunities the system provides at the regional, sub-regional, and national levels, and at both government and industry level. Let's come a little closer to home now. The countries of the Caribbean region are dependent to a very large extent on shipping, which not only provides the backbone of trade links, both within the region and with the wider international community, but is also itself an engine for economic growth. Up to 2012, the registries of the Caribbean countries were together responsible for approximately 4,720 merchant ships of 72 million tons, representing 4.5% of the world fleet in terms of number and nearly 7% in terms of tonnage. Shipping also contributes significantly to the tourism sector. More than 45% of world cruise shipping takes place in the Caribbean, with its beautiful beaches, picturesque scenery, and generally advantageous climate that provide major attractions. We must also remember that the Caribbean is one of the world's great shipping routes. Tonnage heading to or from the Panama Canal inevitably passes through the Caribbean Sea you will undoubtedly conclude that all these considerations clearly demonstrate how important it is that the countries of the Caribbean play a full and active part in the regulatory and standard setting and implementation process, including port state control, that IMO sets in motion for international shipping. Should the region participate fully in the activities of IMO, it will receive full benefit from the international regulatory framework that has brought about such considerable improvements in shipping standards for safety and environmental protection over successive decades. It must be noted, however, that the ever-increasing pressures on the mar marine environment and the impacts of human activities, for example, shipping, maritime tourism, oil exploration, fishing, and climate change underscore the continuing global importance of IMO instruments on protection of the marine environment. The particular issues facing the Caribbean Sea, such as the risk associated with increased vessel traffic, need for search and rescue operations, and further cooperation for port state control the exploration and movement of oil and the threat of invasive species reinforce the ever-increasing importance of cooperation through activities of IMO in this region and further cooperation for port state control. To address these challenges, the Secretary General implemented a review and reform initiative aimed at improving IMO's delivery mechanism to handle its ever-increasing workload. 
The organization, organization seeks to tackle newly emerging priorities under increasingly restrictive financial circumstances following the unprecedented economic contraction and financial crises and tight budgetary controls. In recognition of the difficult economic situation affecting governments and industry alike, a number of initiatives are under consideration in the Secretariat addressing issues such as staffing, outsourcing, automation, and forward planning. All this is aimed at delivering the new watchwords at IMO, the same or more with less. Inevitably, some sacrifices will have to be made by both the Secretariat and the membership to achieve economies and new ways of working in the future. It is hoped that member governments will see this as an opportunity to refine our ways of working and improve the efficiency of activities at IMO. Funding requirements based on requests for technical assistance of the Integrated Technical Cooperation Program, familiarly known by us as ITCP, during the 2014-2015 biennium, will have to increase to over US $25 million, which is a 5% increase compared to the funding requirements of the ITCP in the current biennium, which is 2012-2013. Consequently, the Secretary General has tasked a cross-divisional resource mobilization team in the Secretariat to develop a framework strategy to provide direction on how IMO may be able to secure long-term and sustainable funding from diverse sources in order to support ITCP activities for the uniform implementation of IMO instruments. To also promote the effectiveness of the ITCP for the 2014-2015 biennium, changes have been made to its structure. The intention has been twofold. To reduce thematic priorities established by various IMO committees, and to develop more national as opposed to regional events in order to better address the real needs of individual developing countries. In that regard, the Secretary General's initiative to adopt a more targeted approach towards addressing the real needs of developing countries when planning its technical cooperation activities through the use of the country maritime profiles was agreed to be a useful tool in the identification of capacity building needs and to ensure effective delivery of IMO's ITCP. The Secretary General welcomes the receipt of country maritime profiles in early 2014 to facilitate the development of the ITCP from 2015 onwards. Trinidad and Tobago is urged to support the ongoing efforts of the organization to reduce administrative burdens. Global standards for safety, security, and protection of the environment are vital for the shipping industry, and industry stakeholders dedicate significant resources and costs to achieve and maintain these standards. The IMO also has a responsibility to keep such costs as moderate as possible. States were therefore urged to circulate as widely as possible the public consultation on reduction of administrative burdens launched in May of this year. The Secretary, Secretary General's view is that the maritime industry itself is part of the solution to reduce administrative burdens. It is therefore important that the many stakeholders, that is, everyone, including the general public, have their say in the exercise and take the opportunity of responding to the consultation for us to know how the requirements of the conventions influence the daily operations of shipping. It is hoped that a large number of responses will be received by its close at the end of October, so you still have some time, generating many ideas how we can do things better and smarter. This year, 2013, marks a number of significant anniversaries at IMO. It has been 40 years since the adoption of MARPOL, 
30 years since the establishment of the World Maritime University in Malmö, Sweden. It, has also, it is also 30 years since Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II officially opened the new IMO, well then at that time, IMO headquarters building on 17th of May, 1983. Next year is the 100th anniversary of the first SOLAS convention as the organization moves, continues to move to a more scientifically based and goal-oriented approach to ship safety, including the improved use of casualty investigation data and trends. In that regard, the Secretary General expressed concern regarding the current status of the formalization of the Trinidad and Tobago Search and Rescue Region. Despite the importance of such a cooperation arrangement for the provision of expeditious and effective search and rescue services, ongoing efforts since 2007 to formalize the agreement have been unable to be completed. The countries of the Trinidad and Tobago Search and Rescue Region are encouraged to formalize the agreement with all speed in consideration of the safety of life at sea and the protection of the marine environment. In closing, IMO has long been a strong advocate and supporter of marine protection and safety and security of shipping activities in the Caribbean region through the Office of the Regional Maritime Advisor. Although established in 1985, this came under the auspices of the IMO from the year 2000, and the Secretary General conveys his profound gratitude to the government of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago for its in-kind support to the region. Additionally, appreciation is also conveyed to Trinidad and Tobago's contribution in studies undertaken to ascertain the possibilities of the use of LNG as a fuel for shipping. The first study looked at the feasibility of using LNG as a fuel for short sea and coastal shipping in the wider Caribbean region. And the second, which is currently in progress, examines specifically the use of LNG as a fuel for a high-speed passenger ship operating from the Port of Spain ferry terminal in Trinidad and Tobago. Both studies provide vital information to the shipping industry globally in support of the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions from ships. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you. Mr. Colin Young, the envoy of the Secretary General of the IMO, the University of Trinidad and Tobago, the Chairman of the Board of the Governors of the University of Trinidad and Tobago, and the President of the University of Trinidad and Tobago. We would like to thank you very much for being here today, and we would like very much if you convey to Secretary General in London that they would find a strong partner and a willing partner, and a willing partner, and an able partner in the University of Trinidad and Tobago. <laughs> Honorable Senator Fazal Karim, the Minister of Tertiary Education and Training, MTES, has sent his apologies because he is unable to be here this evening. However, his distinguished cabinet colleague, Senator the, uh, Senate, uh, the Honorable Stephen Cadiz, Member of Parliament and Minister of Transport, braved the traffic and he is here with us this evening and we are immensely grateful for his distinguished presence on our campus. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Honorable Minister of Transport, Mr. Stephen Cadiz. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and, um, and thank you for that very warm welcome. The last time I was here was about two years ago, and they gave me a little turn on the simulator, and I actually crashed the ship into the Hyatt. 
So luckily this time um, that, that was not going to be the case. Dr. Ali, uh, uh, well of course Minister um, Karim is not here, um, Mr. Curtis Manchu, Chairman of the Board of, of, of UTT, a man who I've known for many years, Captain Curtin uh, Huggins, Director, Deputy Director of, of Maritime Services, uh, Professor Daya Narang Singh, and of course, uh, IMO Regional Advisor, Mr. Colin Young, specially invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it is indeed my pleasure to address you here today on the occasion of the International Observance of World Maritime Day 2013. Under this year's theme, Sustainable Development, IMO's Contribution Beyond Rio Plus 20. Uh, World Maritime Day is observed annually by the international community to heighten awareness worldwide of the integral role of the shipping industry in the global transportation network and the goals and objectives of the IMO. This year's theme focuses on three dimensions of sustainable development. These are economic, environmental, and social elements, all equally important in the movement of goods by the maritime transportation system. The challenge, however, lies in how these can be translated equitably and fairly across the chain of actors in order to make the entire system sustainable. As we probably all are very much aware, international shipping transports over 90% of global trade to people and communities around the world. And it is incumbent, therefore, on the shipping industry to constantly strive to improve its procedures and be prepared to adapt to a changing regulatory standards through the enactment of the relevant shipping legislation. Over the years, the Ministry of Transport has devoted its energies to promoting safe and secure shipping and the preservation of the marine environment from ship-generated pollution. Recently, the Ministry held a stakeholder consultation on the amendment to the Shipping Act of 1987 to include new and amended international instruments. This will ensure compliance with the international standards relating to the facilitation of maritime traffic, the safety and security of life and property at sea, and the safety of navigation. And I must say, coming into a government in 2010, one of the, as Minister of Trade, um, one of the first things I was introduced to um, when it came to shipping was what, is, what we know in Trinidad and Tobago was the Drogas Act. And the Drogas Act, I think, was developed in 19-something. A little before my time, maybe not before Dr. Ali's time, but it was like 19, 1908 or something like that. And here it is that we have modern Trinidad and Tobago with the largest LNG facility in the world, and we are operating on old, outdated, archaic legislation. So from since 2010, I have been very much aware of what um, the, the stumbling blocks were in the, in the maritime industry, um, either through trade or of course getting into tourism, we also have the issues of cruise ships, etc., and yachting and what have you that fall under it. And therefore, it, was, it is imperative that Trinidad and Tobago um, has a 2013 um, Shipping Act, which we will be getting very shortly. The Ministry of Transport has embarked also on a number of initiatives to promote the sustainable development of the maritime industry. And these include the establishment of a committee to develop and implement a national maritime policy and action plan for the sustainable development of the maritime sector, which is presently under the consideration of cabinet. Legislative reform, we just spoke about that, including the development of updating of legislation pertaining to safety and security of ships. The establishment of a vessel traffic management system that will allow for the identification and monitoring of ships in Trinidad and Tobago waters. And from what I've been uh, made on, from what I understand, that we already have the um, vessel traffic management system. And as of today in cabinet, um, we got the approval to go ahead for the installation of it. And therefore, we will be um, soon. I, I would, I would, I, I don't know the details of what has to happen now, um, but at least we are proceeding with getting the system installed. Um, the single electronic window. Again, when I was in trade, we brought this. Um, to fruition, um, the single electronic window within an e-maritime system in collaboration with the Ministry of Trade and Industry and Investment, which of course um, speaks to the whole issue of the trade, which is um, cargo and, and, and importing and exporting and what have you. And where it is, Trinidad is famous now for its, 
I think, 70 clearing time on the port. Um, we hope to have that down into hours, which is what it should be. If you want to run a, a successful port business, you cannot be turning containers around um, in seven days. It just does not work like that. Uh, the establishment of an open ship registry. I understand right now, I don't know, uh, the previous speakers I might be giving wrong info as usual, but um, I think there's something, I, I can't, let me don't call it figure because I, I, I know I'm going to um, mess it up, but um, an open ship registry, and what we're going to be doing is going after, get Trinidad and Tobago on the international map as a place where you would want to um, register your, your ships. Of course, port expansion. I think uh, many of us here have, have heard of the plans of setting up a major transshipment port um, in the southwestern peninsula down in the La Brea area. Um, the La Brea area is a place, of course, that has a, 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 a whole history of shipping because of the, the oil fields and what have you. But then there's also the issue of the commercial port at Plipdeco. What do we do with that? There's also the issue of the commercial port in the port of Port of Spain. Many cities worldwide, for those of you who travel, you will see where the original ports and port lands are no longer. The ports, the commercial ports have moved on, moved into less expensive land areas. And right now, the port of Port of Spain sits on probably the most valuable property in Trinidad and Tobago, which makes no sense to me um, by putting steel boxes on this very expensive real estate. So these are things that we're looking at. Um, the issue of dockyard facilities. Again, we have a dockyard facility right here, um, with the old carry dock. And again, how do we expand that? Do we expand it here? Do we, do we build another, another facility? Um, there's the issue of, somebody had mentioned earlier on, the issue of shipbuilding. Now, I know we're not going to be competing with Korea and other um, other major shipbuilding nations, but there are many ships, many smaller vessels that can actually be constructed and fabricated right here in Trinidad and Tobago, and there's no reason why we can't. From what I understand in the oil field, in the oil field business we have in the vicinity of about 200 vessels, small vessels, whether they're work boats or crew boats or specialty boats that, um, that are based here in Trinidad servicing the oil field. So these are things that we, we are pursuing. Um, the education, training, and certification of seafarers in keeping with the IMO and ILO conventions. Continued collaboration with the IMO on ballast water management to reduce and possibly eradicate the transfer of alien species through ship's ballast water exchange. Um, Colin, of course, has stole my thunder when he spoke about alternative fuel vessels. And right now, we are, in fact, looking at Two areas um, in, the marine, in the marine area, um, one of course is our Tobago ferries, and it's something that we would want to, there are ferries now being built with um, LNG fuel engines using um, gas turbines, and uh, in fact one um, similar to, very similar to what we have here um, with the fast ferries, a, a, a very similar vessel right, is going to start um, its run in Argentina, between Argentina and Uruguay, um, in about maybe a month's time. So we'd want to see what the performance of that vessel is. I understand there are LNG vessels that are already operating in Norway. Right now, the ferries run approximately 100 million TT dollars. If we were to pay full retail for the diesel that is used just on the Tobago ferries, just the two ferries, it is in excess of 100 million TT dollars per annum, just to run, just to run fuel. The, um, the PTSC, the PTSC, I know that's not exactly marine, but it still comes under public transport. And the, and the PTSC fleet, we are burning roughly 40 million dollars TT a year um, in, in diesel. So besides the cost, the environmental damage by burning fossil fuels like that, um, diesel, and that is something that we are seriously considering, and therefore we would be looking to change those um, ferries out um, using the new technology with, with turbines. Um, the other thing about turbines, of course, is turbines can run up to 30,000, 40,000 hours before you have to overhaul them as against reciprocating engines. So these, all of these are things that we, we're looking at, bringing Trinidad to where it's supposed to be, the newest technology. Another area of interest for public transport, of course, is the water taxis. And those water taxis, again, very, very expensive to run with diesel fuel. And we'll be looking at doing the conversion um, uh, with the existing engines from, um, from diesel to CNG. So 
without a doubt, um, the maritime industry, we are, we are ensuring that our maritime industry is in a very healthy condition. Another area that we're looking at, um, uh, and this is, again is from my, my tourism days, which would be the Southern Cruise Initiative, which is home porting of smaller tourist vessels, um, cruise ships, maybe between 800 to 1,600 passengers, vessels of that size, where Trinidad can actually home port. Um, and again, one of the big advantages is, is, of course, the availability of fuel on island. So, ladies and gentlemen, these are just but a few of the initiatives being pursued by the government, and as we seek to keep pace with developments in the maritime and shipping industries internationally. Ministry of Transport joins the national community, particularly the maritime industry, in celebrating World Maritime Day 2013. In keeping with this year's theme, the government remains committed to transitioning to a greener economy, evolving around the economic, social, and environmental dimensions. On the occasion of World Maritime Day, I wish to underscore the commitment of the government of Trinidad and Tobago to continue to encourage and support the sustainable development of the maritime sector. However, ladies and gentlemen, this could only become a reality through cooperation, coordination, and consultation among all stakeholders, including national and international public and private interests and international organizations. And one of the ways in which I conduct my business is that there is that consultation. I do nothing without going to the stakeholders. I do nothing without going to the people that it is going to affect in some way, positively or negatively. And therefore, we work all of this out. And then we bring it. Then we bring the legislation. Then we bring the new policies and what have you. And um, I, I can honestly say that uh, I think the second day in office, we had this consultation for the Shipping Act. And that Shipping Act will be in this parliament. And I hope it will be in this parliament um, before the end of this year, that we can finally see Trinidad and Tobago coming of age, where no longer will we have the infamous Drogas Act. In this regard, I wish to acknowledge the continued support and collaboration which is being provided by the IMO, IMO to the government and people of Trinidad and Tobago. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much for your attention, and I do apologize for being late. Students of the University of Trinidad and Tobago, you just witnessed leadership vision, and you just had a scattershot of possible futures. And I will ask Minister Kedis to kindly leave with us a copy of the dream sheet. <laughs> and I will ask Professor Vivian Rambaran to revisit the dream sheet with the student body and to examine how we can possibly help Minister Cadiz arrive at those destinations. He presented a grand tour of possible futures for you. And I hope you paid close attention because you are the future of the industry. And he is pointing to windows and doors that can enhance your future and the quality of your life and the development of our country. Minister Cadiz, we could never thank you enough for your presentation. Now I would like to invite Captain Curtin Huggins, who is the Deputy Director, Maritime Services, Maritime Services Department of the Ministry of Transport to move a vote of thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, Dr. Karam. Well, as he more or less implied, there's no end to any occasion without saying thanks, which is my input here today. I'd like to first thank the Almighty for to whom we owe good life and health for bringing us here safely to attend and also to impress upon him our safe return. The Honorable Minister of Transport, you know, my line boss, the Honorable 
Senate Honorable Member of Parliament, Mr. Stephen Kiddies. Well, following from Dr. Ali's closing words here just now, you have left a lot of inspiration with not only the students, but also for the industry. I also would like to applaud your sustained enthusiasm with respect to the maritime industry and its development, and we too look forward to your assistance, we meaning the maritime services uh, for now department. You know, to, for your assistance with respect to our efforts in amending the Shipping Act. So thank you very much, sir, and I know it was a real great effort on your part because I was in constant contact with your advisor who kept us abreast of your rapid movement through the traffic. I'd also like to commend the IMO advisor and the IMO by extension, Mr. Colin Young, for also um, expressing his remarks from the Secretary, Secretary General. And uh, the, the University of Trinidad and Tobago, I must say, and also the Trinidad and Tobago Pilots Association, I must applaud them for their efforts and the role played in ensuring the importance of this event is maintained and also recognized. I do applaud you all, no doubt, um, the efforts of uh, Professor Parasram, better known as Vevo Para, <laughs> and also Pilot Master Kurt Duncan. I know this was not have been possible without the concurrence of the Chairman of the Board of Directors, Mr. Curtis Manchun, and do thank you for your participation and your involvement in today's proceedings, sir. And also the president of the university, Professor Diana Reinsing, your, I mean to say your statistics that you included in your speech does make, you know, press up on me to give mention of, uh, to think about the team and to be satisfied that sustainable, sustainable development is being maintained accordingly. The provost, well, Dr. Ali, I must say, you know, I, you really kept it alive, the proceedings are alive. And I know you are very much involved with UTT, and I do thank you for your interest and involvement, even to you know, impressing upon the, the head professor, Mrs. Sparrow, to use more Maritime terminology like port and starboard, backing and veering. So I know I also wish to thank you for guiding us here this this afternoon. With respect to I also have a mention in the staff also. I had a long, quite a long list. And I, was, I was quite surprised. This was given to me by Para. And I was quite surprised she, you know, she rallied the whole troops and also ensured that they brought this off. And I must commend the corporate communications department, the campus manager, Mrs. Karim, and her team, the faculty and staff of the maritime and marine programs, the student guild under Mr. Bechu. Uh, hey, Beatrice, you had to work hard you know, for your, to maintain your popula popularity for election. <laughs> and also, I must know, they work very hard because, you know, we were in contact kind of till late last night uh, until I had to hope that Ms. Viv wouldn't call me again. So I knew she was up late last night rallying her troops and she assured me they are still working. So I must compliment you for your efforts and also the staff of the university for ensuring this occasion came off. And as was mentioned here before, our efforts would be in vain if not for the future of the maritime industry. And I'd like to commend the students for attending and ensuring or being aware of the significance of this event. And I know you all have been a bit more excited than this morning in one of the efforts being made by the government and the, uh, their initiatives.
to promote the maritime industry that you will meet upon your department from here. Ladies and gentlemen, I do implore you with God's blessings to have a safe journey home and upon the upon the party and a good night. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you very much, Captain. And as we close, Minister Kedis, I would like to just remind you that the chairman of UTT, Mr. Curtis Manchun, and the president of UTT, we recently signed an agreement with the government of Japan on dimethyl ether as a new fuel. So it is something you could begin to look at with us because we uh, will be testing a number of engines using that fuel. It is a green fuel and it's a significant research partnership between the UTT and the government of Japan and Mr. Manchun and the president of the university can enlighten you on this because our president is a chemist and understands the dimethyl ether uh, molecule very well. And president will be in the laboratory on that piece of research. And another point you raise, I want to draw your attention to the fact that our program leader, Ms. Para, as she was referred to, is senior legal counsel here. And we have a lot of legal resources in the university to guide um, this redrafting of legislation and repealing of legislation. And we also, I'd like to also acknowledge the presence of Mr. Darwin uh, Monzano, the Corporate Secretary of the University of Trinidad and Tobago. <laughs> At this point, it gives me great pleasure to invite you to join with us, to have refreshments, and to join in the guided tour of the facilities. Ladies and gentlemen, University of Trinidad and Tobago is grateful for your presence. Thank you very much.